<laughs> From atop the clock tower roof, a ceremony to call the gods is held, and an ancient song is sung. This is Legendary Adventures, a Legend of Zelda playthrough podcast. This week in Majora's Mask, we're staying up all night, reuniting Anju and Cafe, and traveling to the moon for a final confrontation. Part 1. The Final Masks The Stockpot Inn in East Clocktown is run by Anju, a woman who looks a lot like the chicken lady from Kakariko Village in Ocarina of Time. Her mother also helps run the inn. Her grandmother lives in a room on the first floor. Her grandmother is getting on in years and may or may not be going senile. Spending time in the inn, we can see her pretend to be confused on who Anju is in order to avoid eating Anju's apparently bad cooking. At the same time, if we visit her ourselves, she seems to confuse Link for her late son, Tortoise. She offers to tell us a story, but will never make it to the end of her stories without a little assistance. That assistance comes in the form of a mask. A mask that I needed a walkthrough to help me find. It's the All Night Mask. We can find it for sale in the Curiosity Shop, but only on the third night, and only if we foiled the robbery of the mother of the bomb shop owner on the first day. The mask costs 500 rupees. It features wide, staring eyes, and it is said to force the wearer to stay awake no matter how much they wish to sleep. Andrew's grandmother tells two stories. The first is about the Carnival of Time. It takes two hours to tell. From the story, we learn that the carnival is held each year when the sun and moon are in alignment, paying homage to the way that both nature and time are tirelessly in the process of progressing. People from every region of Termina, referred to as the Four Worlds, gather. They wear homemade masks resembling giants who are the gods of the Four Worlds. We're told that people who are married during the festival dedicate a special mask as a sign of their union. And when the clock tower opens, people go to the roof to pray to the giants in hopes for a good harvest in the year to come. The second story Anju's grandmother tells is of the four giants. This story takes until morning to hear the whole thing. We need to wear the all-night mask to make it to the very end. We're told in the ancient past all the people of Termina lived together, and their gods, the four giants, lived among them. One day, on the day of the festival, the giants left to sleep. They departed, each traveling to one of the four cardinal directions of the compass. 100 steps north, 100 steps south, 100 steps east, 100 steps west. The giants told the people to call them with a song if they needed help. One person was upset by the giant's decision to leave. An imp. The Skull Kid. We're told he was friends with the giants and felt abandoned. He acted out and tormented the people of Termina. We're told that the people called on the giants to deal with the imp. The giants commanded him to leave. We are told that he returned to the heavens. And yet, we know the Skull Kid is here, and that he is still upset at the loss of his friends. The Stockpot Inn is also the center of another quest. Back in the second episode of the season, we met Madame Aroma, the mayor's wife. She gave Link a mask with the appearance of her son, Cafe, and tasked Link with finding him. Cafe is engaged to Anju. The couple is set to be married on the day of the festival. Now, he is missing. We must find him and help reunite the couple. This is a lengthy process that requires the full three days. In 2017, director Eiji Onuma spoke to Japanese gaming website Denfa Minico about the inspiration for this quest. He said, Actually, the event started when I attended the wedding of a staff member with Mr. Koizumi after The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was completed. We started talking and we realized that we had never seen weddings in the gaming world. He continued, The scene is based on my generation's perception on marriage. It was meant to be solved at the end to make players feel dramatic. So the waiting process was put in intentionally. We dragged it out until the very end. Wearing Cafe's mask, we can speak to people to get information on where Cafe might be. This information is useful for completing the quest. But the first big break comes at the Stockpot Inn. At 2 p.m. on the first day, the postman delivers a letter. It's a letter that seems to shake Anju to her core. If we speak to Anju with the Cafe mask on after the letter is delivered, she will tell Link that she has a clue that will help find him. 
She asks us to return to the inn at 11.30 p.m. The inn closes and locks its ground level door at 8.30 p.m. So we have options for how we plan to stay late. Anju only locks the ground level door, and there is a door on the second story which can be reached through the use of a Deku flower outside. Or we could get ourselves a room key. Even though the inn is fully booked, we can check in. It seems someone with a reservation shares the name with the player's link. It seems you have to check in during the afternoon, before the Goron who shares Link's name arrives. He gets to the inn at 4 p.m. I first checked into the inn as a human during my second cycle of three days. Here, when I was trying to complete this quest, I donned the Goron mask. I did it because I had, on a failed attempt to complete Andrew and Cafe's quest, tried to check in too early and was told the place was booked up. I changed my appearance this time around just to be safe. The Goron who actually reserved the room arrives and discovers that his room has somehow been taken. He decides to sleep outside since the weather is nice. We, however, know that rain is coming. And oh yeah, you can fail this quest. Turns out that it's essential not to stop the robbery in North Clocktown on the first night if you want to reunite this couple. I thought I might be able to get the All Night Mask and complete this quest in one go. But no, you have to separate them. Returning to the inn at 11.30pm, we meet Anju in the kitchen. She explains the letter that she received was from Cafe. She gives us a letter and asks us to put it in a post box for her in the morning. We do just that. After placing the letter, we're told it will be delivered in the afternoon. But where? When wearing the cafe mask, several people will mention that they see cafe hanging out near the laundry pool. You may have noticed him yourself emerging from the laundry pool to mail his letter on the first day. He's hiding his face behind a Keaton mask and looks suspiciously small. The laundry pool is located in southwest Clocktown. There is a door on the north side of the pool that seems to always be locked. I camped out at the pool because I did not know when the letter would be delivered. The postman arrives at 3 p.m. and rings a bell on the eastern side of the pool. Cafe emerges from the locked door and goes to meet the postman, giving us a chance to sneak through the now unlocked door. Inside, we find a small cluttered room at the top of some stairs. After a short wait, we meet Cafe. He confirms what we already suspected and removes his mask to reveal that he is a child? He was apparently transformed by the Skull Kid, but that is not the reason he is hiding. He tells us he went to the Great Fairy in North Clocktown for help after he was transformed, and while he was leaving the Great Fairies, he was robbed and his wedding mask was stolen. He and Anju plan to be married on the day of the festival, and plan to exchange masks according to tradition. Cafe says he's keeping an eye on the Curiosity Shop, hoping to see the thief turn up so he can track him. He also gives us a pendant to give to Anju. Giving the pendant to Anju in the end makes her happy. She tells us that she has decided to wait for Cafe to return, and will not flee with the others on the third day. After 1pm on the third day, we can return to Cafe's hideout. We don't find him, but the curiosity shop owner. He explains he and Cafe were childhood friends. He gives us the Keaton mask, which he had gifted to Cafe as a child the first time. He also gives us a letter to Cafe's mother, Madame Aroma. In addition, he tells us that Sakon the thief visited the curiosity shop last night, and Cafe recognized him. He knows Sakon makes Ikana his base of operations, and says Cafe has gone there. Traveling to Ikana, we can find Cafe hiding behind a rock near the end of the river. He is waiting for Sakon to appear. The thief doesn't show his face until 6 p.m. He opens a secret passageway and disappears inside. Cafe follows, and we follow Cafe. The wedding mask is displayed inside a case within the hideout, but Cafe fails to notice a floor switch right in front of it. Stepping on the switch causes the mask to start moving on a conveyor belt away from Lincoln Cafe. What follows is a first for the series. We take control of both Link and Cafe in alternating turns. Cafe and Link move down parallel paths on the side of the conveyor belt. On Cafe's side, we take on pushing block puzzles to open doors for Link. On Link's side, we take on combat challenges to open doors for Cafe. If we get both characters to the end of the conveyor belt fast enough, Cafe reclaims his mask and says he's headed back to Clocktown to meet Anju.
In the final hours before the moon falls, we return to Clocktown and visit the milk bar. It's empty except for the owner, Barten, and Cafe's mother, Madame Aroma. If we speak to her with Cafe's mask on, we can deliver his letter to her. As a reward for finding Cafe, she gives Link a bottle of special Chateau Romani milk. This is the fifth bottle I collected. There are actually six in Majora's Mask, but I only got five. This marks the first time a Zelda game that features bottles has more than four. In general, most Zelda games that feature bottles only include four, but we will see at least one other with more than four. Finally, we can return to the Stockpot Inn and join Anju in her room on the second floor waiting for Cafe to return. Cafe arrives when only an hour and a half remains. He and Anju reunite. They exchange their masks to become a couple, and give Link the couple's mask as a symbol of their union. And man, doesn't this just feel weird rather than touching or funny? Cafe was never restored to his adult form, and even Tattle comments on how they look more like mother and son than a couple. Anyway, we reset the clock and return to the first day. There is still one more mask to collect, the postman's hat. It is collected by completing most of the Anju and Cafe quest. We go through the first two and a half days of the quest for a second time. Because I knew the timing of events better instead of just camping out and sitting through a lot of dead time, I used the time between events to round up a few pieces of heart. I also used the Song of Double Time to skip ahead, if I needed. After getting the letter for Madame Aroma on the afternoon of the third day, the quest peels off. We no longer need to go to Akana. Instead, we visit the post office after 6 p.m. The postman is there. He wishes to flee the falling moon, but it's not on his schedule. He feels trapped by his job. If we give him the letter from Cafe, he will deliver it to the milk bar. After delivering it, he will stand outside for a moment. If we speak to him, he tells us that Madame Aroma gave him permission to run. He gives us the postman's hat because he doesn't need it anymore. With this, we now have all the masks. Part 2. The Final Confrontation After getting the hat, I got ready for the final confrontation. I withdrew money from the bank and went to the general store, only it was empty. I should have known. Instead, I soared to the Great Bay where I rounded up two fairies and bought three red potions. I then soared back to Clock Town and went to the Clock Tower. At midnight, the tower opens. After ascending to the top, we see an abbreviated version of the scene that played out during our first confrontation with the Skull Kid on the first three days. Again, the moonfall is accelerated. This time, however, we have freed all the giants, so we call them. The giants appear. Each one is at its cardinal direction on the compass. They reach Clock Town in just a few steps. When all have arrived, they reach out and they catch the moon. The moon is stopped and the Skull Kid lays on the ground. Tattle and Tell are reunited. It seems we have saved the day. Tell asked Tattle not to be hard on Skull Kid. He was lonely and the power of the mask was too much for him. The mask. It pulls Skull Kid's body from the ground and raises him into the air. Skull Kid hangs limp below the mask. Then, the mask speaks. A puppet that can no longer be used is mere garbage. The mask drops Skull Kid to the ground. The mask itself is sentient. It rises up into the now open mouth of the moon. The moon's eyes, those disturbing, endlessly staring orange eyes, glow brighter. Then, a voice comes from the moon. I shall consume. Consume everything, it says. Suddenly the giants begin to strain against the moon again, as it seems to push against them. 
there is only one thing to do. We go up into the moon. <coughs> there is a blinding flash of white, and Link finds himself in a most unusual place. Inside the moon is a green field. The sun is high in the sky. A single mass of trees sits atop a hill in the distance. The only sound is the song of birds. Naturally, we run to the tree. Four kids dressed in white and wearing the masks of the bosses run around the tree. A fifth child wearing Majora's mask sits at the base of the tree. We speak to him. Will you play with me? He asks. We say we will. You only have weak masks, he declares. So he asks again. So, you'll play? Again, we answer yes. Well, shall we go? The child asks. And away we go. After another blinding flash of white, we find ourselves in a colorful arena. There is a sunburst pattern on the far wall, and other patterns to each side of the sunburst. The masks of the bosses each mount to the walls on these patterns, while Majora's mask is revealed to be in the center of the sunburst. The final fight with Majora plays out in three parts. In the first part, the mask flies around the room. It has dozens of tentacles trailing from its back. The mask is armored on the front, but vulnerable in the back. This means we must hit it from behind. However, that's easier said than done. I actually found this first phase to be the most difficult part of the fight. I attempted to hit it with arrows, but it always seemed to turn at the last second, meaning arrows were ineffective. It was easier to land hits with the sword. Occasionally, the mask turns on its side and performs a spinning attack. It was generally during this attack that I was able to land a hit. After a couple of hits, the mask of the bosses come off the wall and start to fly around the room. These I primarily took out with arrows. Three arrows to down a mask. After the other masks enter the fight, Majora's mask starts to shoot a laser at Link in addition to the spinning attack. I found it easiest to land hits during the spinning attack phase still. After a few more hits, I defeated the mask and a new phase of the fight began. Majora's mask sprouts thin, spindly arms and legs, and a small head that is taken up mostly by a single large eye. This is Majora's incarnation. It's a strange, erratic version of Majora. It runs with great speed, dances ballet, moonwalks, and even attacks by shooting energy balls at Link. It's much easier to land a hit on Majora during this phase. It has no armor. We can stun it with arrows or simply hit it with the sword. It occasionally falls down, allowing us to land additional hits. It's an off-kilter and entertaining fight. I did drink one red potion during this phase of the fight. It's the only potion I used across all three phases. I never needed a fairy. After Majora's incarnation takes enough hits, the final phase of the fight begins. Majora changes again. Its thin arms and legs suddenly become muscular. Its head seems to unfold and become larger, more defined as an actual head. It still has only a single eye. Long whips sprout from its hands. This is Majora's Wrath. Majora uses its whips to attack and even grab Link. We fire arrows to stun it and then move in to land hits with the sword. After taking enough damage, Majora begins to attack Link using tops. These of course aren't your average top, they're covered in blades. Still, at least for me, my strategy didn't change. I kept firing an arrow to stun Majora and then went in and got some hits with the sword. Eventually Majora fell. The evil was eradicated. But would this really be Majora's Mask if we didn't rewind and fight Majora again? So let's wind the clock back just one more time. Part 3. A Fierce Deity we find ourselves again in the sunlit green field, running towards the massive tree on the hill. Running around the tree are four children. Each one wears the mask of the four dungeon bosses. Each one holds a challenge for Link if he speaks to them. We can speak to them and tackle the challenges in any order. The four challenges combined end up giving the moon a similar feeling to a dungeon like Ganon's castle in Ocarina of Time. 
During this time, we have a chance to get a closer look at these kids, and notice how truly strange they are. Ah, nice weather, isn't it? A child comments, and so it is. The twist comes with his question. Masks. You have a lot. You too? Will you be a mask salesman? We can't see beneath the masks of the children, but we can see that each has red hair styled in the same way as the happy mask salesman. Each will demand mask to play a game of hide-and-seek with them. How many Link must give up depends on which child he is speaking to. The number of masks required is based on the order of the dungeons. So the Odolwa mask child asks for only one, while the Twin Mold mask child demands four. Each game of hide-and-seek represents a challenge based around of one of Link's forms. I started with the Georg mass child. His challenge involves swimming through a maze as Zora Link to find the mass child. If you take the wrong path, you have to start over again. After finding the child, you have to give him more masks. He also leaves us with something to think about. The right thing. What is it? He asks. I wonder, if you do the right thing, does it really make everybody happy? I took the challenge of the child in the goat mask next. We need to Goron roll through a series of jumps and turns. For a long time, this challenge had me thinking that getting the fierce deity mask was more challenging than taking on Majora straight away. I could make the first jump, but I rarely, if ever, could complete the second jump. There are treasure chests that Link is supposed to bounce off of. I fell so many times as I tried to get the joystick pointed in the right direction. Then I looked online for tips and found that the best way to do this is actually to let go of the joystick once Link is at full speed. Then the challenge is reduced to practically zero. You do have to stop after you see a pair of green pots. If you don't, you will fall and have to go again. I found that out the hard way. Then it's just a matter of walking a short distance to line up the final jump and finding the masked child. Again, we give him more masks, and again he leaves us with something to think about. What makes you happy? He asks. Does it make others happy too? For the third challenge, I spoke to the Adolwa masked child. His challenge involves using Deku flowers to fly across a room. There are rotating platforms that we must land on and launch from. It was during this challenge that I first noticed a piece of heart to collect. There is apparently one heart piece in each challenge. I only end up getting two of them. On the last flight, we must notice that one side of the rotating platform holds a pink Deku flower, and the other side holds a gold Deku flower. We need to launch from the gold flower to get the necessary height and distance to reach the masked child. We give him a second mask, and as with the others, he leaves us with something to think about. Your friends. What kind of people are they? He asks. I wonder, do those people think of you as a friend? The Twin Mold Child was the last for me. This challenge is taken on in human form and is essentially a combat challenge. We travel through three rooms, first taking out a Dinophils, then a Garo Master, last an Iron Knuckle. After the final fight, a chest with bomb shoes inside appears. We must use them to blow a hole in a wall to reveal an ice switch that will open the door. In the next room, we need to blow a hole in the ceiling. I used up all my bomb shoes and never managed to break the ceiling. I did not want to start over again, so again I looked online. I learned that playing the Song of Storms will apparently open the door. I had to retreat to the previous room and play the song to make it work. Good on the developers for not leaving people stuck, but how anyone was supposed to figure this out naturally, I have no idea. We give the Twin Mold Mask Child the last of our masks. Only the transformation masks will remain in our inventory. He gives us one last thought. Your true face. What kind of face is it? He asks. I wonder. The face under the mask. Is that your true face? All the children are now gone. All save one. The lone child sitting under the tree wearing Majora's mask. We speak to him. Everyone has gone away, haven't they? He asks. You don't have any mask left, do you? Well, let's do something else. He then gives Link the fierce deity mask. It's a transformation mask of incredible power. Could it be as bad as Majora, the game's narrator wonders? In the second episode of this season, I talked a bit about how Link screams in pain each time he puts on one of the transformation masks. Eiji Onuma told Game Informer in 2015, 
This is because he was being possessed by spirits that contain the memories of someone who died. That begs the question, whose spirit is contained within the fierce deity mask? Aonuma offered Game Informer at least a partial explanation to that question. He said, The best I can give you is a suggestion. The best way to think about it is that the memories of all the people of Termina are inside the Fierce Deity Mask. After getting the Fierce Deity Mask, the child wearing Majora's Mask continues. Let's play good guys against bad guys. Yes, let's play that. Are you ready? You are the bad guy. And when you're bad, you just run. That's fine, right? Well, shall we play? We're again transported to the multicolored arena where we fought Majora before. Again, the masks of the bosses take their spots on the wall. But this time, we put on the Fierce Deity Mask. <laughs> when in Fierce Deity form, Link's sword fires beams. It's a nod to the past games, but there's no limit on when these beams can be fired. The armored front of Majora's Mask cannot protect itself from the strength of the Fierce Deity's Mask. The fight is over in less than two minutes as Link slashes through Majora's Mask, then Majora's Incarnation, and Majora's Wrath. Majora dissolves away in a blinding flash of light. The moon also dissolves away. The people of Termina cheer. The giants again stand tall. Part 4, The Dawn of a New Day With Majora defeated, finally a new day can begin. The three-day cycle is broken. Link wakes up to see the Skull Kid make up with his friends, the Giants. They are still friends after all. The Giants then return to their positions along the cardinal directions of the compass. The Skull Kid also asks Link to be his friend. The masked salesman appears from out of nowhere, again in possession of Majora's mask. He notes the evil that it once contained is now gone. He leaves to continue his travels, but not before noting that Link managed to make many people happy. The masks that you have are filled with happiness, he says, before fading away as if he was never really there at all. Link departs, seemingly heading to leave Termina. Or does he? The carnival begins with a display of fireworks above Clock Town. During the credits, we see a number of happy scenes with the characters we met. That includes the Zora Band, the Indiegogos, who seem to have Link in his Zora form on guitar. Maybe one last hurrah before he truly leaves. Also among the happy scenes, we see Anju and Cafe's wedding. We see part of the ceremony from Cafe's point of view, and in other shots he is obscured by the crowd. Was he changed back? Who knows. Not all scenes are happy, however. Among the scenes of happiness and revelry, we see the Deku butler next to the sad-looking tree we saw at the very beginning of the game. We know Link's transformation mask contained the spirits of people who have died, and it's been implied that the Deku mask contains the spirit of the butler's son. This scene seems to confirm it when even among all the happiness the butler continues to mourn. One last touch of sadness in a game that seems to be defined by it. In the final moments, we're returned to the Lost Woods where the adventure began. Link is again riding a pony through the fog, which starts to burn away. Link rides off, sitting tall, no longer the seemingly beaten and dejected version of himself we saw at the start. And a drawing on a log hints at why. It shows Link, the Skull Kid, and the Giants, standing side by side as friends. Majora's Mask is now complete. Next week we'll take a look at the world and legacy of Majora's Mask. If you want to follow along and you haven't already, please subscribe. Everyone who's subscribed already, thank you. You're awesome. Please also consider sharing this podcast with a friend. I'm Paul Riley, and I will see you next week.